Hello. Today, I have something a little different to share. I made a Python script to generate STL files to make custom coasters so you can bypass CAD. So you can draw or download a PNG image, then you can feed it through the application, adjust some settings, and boom, you get an STL file that you can print. I have to say that this is still a work in progress and there are some significant issues with it. I plan to make another video to follow up and attempt to improve on it, but in this video I will be taking a look at how I made this and how it works and show it in action. I got inspired to do this project after making these coasters in Creo Parametric about a year ago. I had been working on some machine vision algorithms at work, and it just seemed like a fun and useful thing to do. I also wanted to get better at Python, so this seemed like a great way to push my skills. So I'm just going to make a simple spiral here in Paint to start with. And I'll just take a quick screenshot of that and save it to the directory where the script looks for images in. Alright, now that we have our image, let's go ahead and provide the path in our script. Uh, I use a class called coaster image to contain image processing methods. And then I have a function to show the image. Um, let's take a look and see if it loads properly. And yep, that looks pretty good. All right, so up next, let's add a square border around our image. Adding space is important so that we don't cut off any detail when we draw a circle to represent the boundary of the coaster. And I make it a square because I assume all coasters should be circular. I chose to make the color of the added space the average of the colors around the border of the original image. Okay, now we need to convert the image to binary. That is, to have all color values be equal to either 0 or 1. To do this, we need to prompt the user to select where they want to keep and lose detail to make the cutoff. So the image I'm using is already binary, but if we look at a different image with more than two values, we can see what's going on here. It is a tad bit laggy with the slider. But here you can see the successfully binaried image. All values are either 0 or 255. All right, next we need to mark all of the edges between white and black that are in our image. We'll start by going through every white pixel in the image and checking its four surrounding neighbors. If more than two of them are also white, we will make it black as it is not an edge. So for this one here, we can see that one and two of its neighbors are white, so that one will remain white. And for this next one, we can see that one, two, three, four of its neighbors are also white. So that's more than two. We're going to go ahead and make it black. And continuing that logic, we get to here. Next, we're going to make an empty copy of our edge image. And we're once again going to go through every white pixel. This time, if one or two of its four neighbors are white, we copy it across. So this one, one of four of its neighbors is white. So we're going to copy it. But this other one, none of its neighbors are white, so we're not going to copy that one. Okay, and we apply that across the image to get to here. So applying that for real on our spiral image, we get this. And as you can see, the edges look pretty clean. There's no weird bits sticking out or anything. And from here, we're ready to move on to the next section, which is to convert these edges to coordinates. For this next section, I made a new class called Edges that we will use to keep track of all of our stuff. The first thing we want to do with our new class is to create lists of pixel values representing every continuous edge that is present in the image. Once again, we'll go through every single white pixel one at a time. Let's start with this one. We want to check the eight surrounding pixels, starting with the left one and moving counterclockwise. For each pixel we move through, we want to record whether it was a 1 or a 0. Checking left, we see that that's a 0. Lower left is a 1. Lower 0. Lower right 0. Right 1. Upper right 0. Upper 0. Upper left 0. Now we need to take note of how many 1s have occurred. 
In this case, there are two ones. If there are two ones, we need to check both neighboring white pixels and repeat this list for each of them. We would then pick the pixel with the least amount of neighbors or ones that are present in their respective lists. If they both have equal amounts of neighbors, then we're going to pick the first one that occurred in our list. Okay, so once we've identified the next pixel using those confusing lists, we can mark down our current pixel into our edge, black it out, and move on to the next selected pixel. Using this method, we can go through and collect an entire continuous edge until there's nothing left. We will repeat this process and fill new lists until there are no remaining white pixels in our edge image. So there's one weird edge case we have to consider, and this is when there are three neighbors present for a pixel. In that case, we're simply going to take the last found neighbor in our list as our next pixel. All right, now that we have all of the edges of our shapes, we need to understand how they will fit relative to the outside of our coaster. To do this, we will make a guess and prompt the user to adjust the placement of the shapes on the coaster. As you can see, the diameter and the X and Y position of the circle can be adjusted. Okay, now we need to scale the coaster. I adjust the coordinates so that the outer circle is 90 millimeters in diameter. I picked 90 because that seems like a good fit for most cups and bottles. Um, but as you can see here, the scale gets adjusted. Next, we're going to do what I call linear smoothing. Uh, this is just a simple way to reduce the jagged pixel edges that are in our coordinates. The linear smoothing algorithm works by taking in the edge and a single integer argument. I chose two because after playing with it for a while, it seemed to be the most effective. What this argument does is it specifies how far forward and how far back we want to base our smoothing on. So with two as the argument, I would make a temporary list of the previous two pixels, the pixel in question, and the following two pixels in the list. I would then plot a linear line of best fit and move the pixel in question to be at the closest position on the line of best fit. And we'd go ahead and do this for every single pixel in our list. Next, uh, we need to reduce our data a little bit to help with the algorithm reduce chance for error and speed it up. So I removed all points that are within one millimeter of another point. All right, now we're done refining our edges and it's time to get down to business. We need some way to understand which sections of our image should be a depression and which should be left alone. This requires us to build a hierarchy of edges where we can understand how edges are contained within other edges. In order to do this, for each edge, we're going to start a dictionary called hierarchy to keep everything straight. In hierarchy, each edge will have its own dictionary titled with a unique string identifier. From there, we'll keep a list of the points in that edge, a list of segments in that edge where segments are just pairs of points, a list called parents, which refers to which edges this edge is inside of, a list called children, which is which edges are inside of this edge, and finally, a level, which refers to how deep this shape is from the exterior. Getting the points and segments are easy enough, but filling out the parents and children will require a method to determine if an edge is inside another edge. I struggled with how to do this for some time, but I found a mostly reliable, although slow way to determine this. So for an edge, you would find the point that is closest to 0, 0. You would then draw a line from 0, 0 to that point. Next, you would check if that line that you just drew intersects with any of the segments that are present in the other edge. If there are an odd number of intersections, this indicates that the shape you are checking is inside of the other shape. So in this case, green is inside of red. Conversely, if there are an even number of intersections, we know that the shape is outside of the other shape. So for this one, yellow is outside of blue. This method we just described is called geofencing, and we use it to fill out the parents list first. The children list and the level can both be filled out by referencing the complete parents list. Alright, so next we need to understand what our groupings are, that is, what shapes are present in our image. 
basically we want to know for every shape is it a valley or a plateau what edges constitute the shape which edge is the outer one and which edges are inside if any to organize our work here let's make another dictionary called groupings similarly there will be a unique identifier for each group and a subdictionary beneath that id in that subdictionary we'll have an element for outer containing just the id of the outer edge inners a list of the IDs of the inner edges, and then valley, which is just a true-false. Before we go any further, it makes the most sense to quickly go over how an STL file is structured and what sorts of rules we need to meet from our code. I only worked with the binary style of STLs, but there's also an ASCII version that I didn't bother familiarizing myself with, so we're just going to focus on binary in this video. All right, so the structure of the SCL is organized like this. First, we have 80 uint eights serving as our header, which is meaningless as far as I'm concerned. We're just gonna add these as zeros to our file. Then we have one uint 32, that is the number of triangles that will be described in this file. Then we have our triangles. Each triangle is made of 12 32-bit floating point numbers structured in IEE, 754 format. Not sure why dolphins were naming mathematical number formats, but here we are. Here's the code I used to convert normal Python floats to dolphin numbers. Okay, so inside each triangle, we first have three 32-bit floats for the normal vector of the triangle facing outward. Then we have three 32-bit floats for the first vertex. Again, for the second vertex, and again for the third. Then we have a uint16 spacer, which we leave as zero between every triangle. And that's all we need to know about STL file structure for this project. Next, we need to understand a few simple rules about how we make our triangles. The first rule is that all points should only be vertexes of triangles. So the example on the left here is good, but the example on the right is bad because that point in the center is in the middle of an edge of another triangle. So if we drew another line here, then that would fix the problem. The second rule is that triangles must be oriented counterclockwise relative to their normal vector. That vector will always point outward away from our 3D shape, and if you're looking down into that vector, your points must be listed in counterclockwise order. Rule three is that all of our coordinates that we use in the triangles should be positive, excluding normal vectors. Rule four is that all triangles should be listed in increasing Z value order, that is from bottom to top. I made a single algorithm to handle all flat surface triangle generation. I call it the minimum angle method. The first thing it does is check for the minimum available angle and then once it's found it, it will attempt to draw a line across to complete the triangle using that angle. It's important to check that that proposed line doesn't intersect with any existing line segments. If it does produce an intersection, then we'll find the next smallest angle and try again. Once we've found a valid triangle selection, we'll record it into a list, remove the point that we drew the minimum angle on, and continue and we just rinse and repeat to get the entire shape recorded. To reiterate, if we do encounter an intersection, then we'll find a different angle that suits us, and that should solve the problem. One other condition we will have to consider is when we have shapes within other shapes. The solution conceptually isn't hard, but it's a bit tricky programmatically. So what we're going to do for each inner shape is we'll find the closest distance between an inner and an outer point, and then we'll make the shortest possible bridge to the outside shape, given that there are no intersections in that new segment we're drawing. From there, the inner and outer lists can be combined into one, and then the problem can be solved normally with the original algorithm. All right, so now that we've explained all of that, let's take a look at the code again. So I start by first generating the base, or the bottom of the coaster. 
Next, I generate what I call the valleys and the plateaus. The plateaus would be the face of your coaster, and the valley would be the floors of the depression. In order to build the non-flat walls of the coaster, we will need to do something a little different. We'll start by simply drawing all of the columns, then we'll draw all of the horizontal bars, and finally, we'll connect them with diagonal lines. And here's where I implement that in the code. I start with the outer walls and then do any of the inner walls that might be present in the coaster. I haven't found a great way to plot these, so please forgive the blots. Okay, so we finally have all of our triangles, and all we need to do is write them to our STL file. So we first run a method to collect all of our triangles into an organized list, and then we write them to our STL along with all the other necessary formatting. All right. So let's run through that process once again very quickly. From the user side, we just choose where to cut off the binary. Then we adjust the placement of our outer circle representing the boundary of the coaster. And then we do have to wait a little bit of time, but we should see our file pop up in the main directory where the scripts are located, given that there's no errors. So yeah, our model is looking good. This could then be loaded into a slicer software like Cura, and then once your settings are good, it's ready to print. That's all I have to share this time, but I didn't go over everything in this video. I will be posting all of the code to my GitHub, which will be linked below, but I must warn you that there are still some serious issues with this project, and I wouldn't expect a friendly functional experience if you try to run this yourself. I'm planning on addressing some of these issues and making it a lot more user-friendly as a part two of this video, so please keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, if anyone has any suggestions, I'd be super happy to hear them out. And that's the end of this video. I appreciate you watching, and I really appreciate reaching 100 plus subs before this video. It means a lot, and it's really cheered me up, so thank you. I will be taking a break from the sim racing stuff for now, I unfortunately had an accident rock climbing and I broke my heel, meaning I won't be able to use the pedals for some time. Please leave a like and subscribe and a comment if you enjoyed this. Thank you.